Welcome to the Happy Bones, Happy Life podcast. I'm Margie Bissinger, a physical therapist and integrative health coach, and I am your host and guide on our journey to discover the keys to stronger bones, more happiness, and the secrets to live your best life ever. From nutrition to stress, from exercise to happiness, you will gain revolutionary insights from our leading experts. It is time for you to discover the health and happiness you deserve. Hey, Margie here. Did you ever wonder what the safest, healthiest seafood to eat is? And what about mercury, plastics, wild versus farm-raised? It can be so confusing. Well, the good news is that my guest today is going to help us answer our questions. Randy Hartnell is the CEO of VitalChoice.com, the leading online seafood company that he and his wife Carla founded in 2001. Randy loves sharing his knowledge about the many remarkable benefits of safe, sustainable seafood and providing his customers with reliable access to the very best of it. Prior to founding Vital Choice, Randy spent over 20 years as an Alaskan commercial fisherman. His first book, The Seafood Prescription, Live a Healthier, Happier, Longer Life with Nature's Perfect Food is due out in 2020. And Randy and Carla, his wife, reside in Washington State. And in today's interview, Randy answers all those questions and we go over the benefits of seafood when it comes to our bones and overall health. So stay tuned. Welcome, Randy. I am just so thrilled to have you on the podcast. I see you around twice a year when you're at the conferences, and I always love the samples and the food that you cook up. And you have so much knowledge. I've learned so much from you, and I love what you're doing in the world. So I'm just really, really thrilled to have you here, introduce you to this community, who people have been so excited when I mentioned that you were going to be a guest and talk about seafood because there's so many questions we know how healthy it is but yet people are scared to death because of what they hear so i'm just really thrilled that you're here to so, so sort of clear the air and really educate us to what really the truth is so you know what though before we get started i love your story how you came to do what you do so why don't we go back to the beginning like when you started out i guess as a fisherman how you got there and maybe how you started your company as well. Well, thank you, Margie. It's a, I'm equally thrilled to be here because I love dispelling myths and answering all those questions that we're going to be talking about. Uh, how I got started, I uh, was going to college and I needed a summer job and uh, make a long story short, ended up uh, on a fishing boat in Alaska. And the first year it was pretty challenging, pretty scary, pretty miserable, <laughs> but uh, surprisingly, I fell in love with that over the course of uh, my college years. And when I graduated, uh, rather than go on to grad school, I, I was making good money fishing. I loved the physical nature of it, just being out on the water and uh, took it up as my full-time occupation for, for the next 20 years. And uh, would still be doing it if uh, we, we hadn't had a, a severe crisis in our industry, basically uh, farm salmon, industrial farm salmon uh, exploded on world markets. Uh, the price paid for our wild salmon crashed, and I had to figure out something else to do. It's a really sh abbreviated uh, uh, sort of description of, of what went, what, uh, how I got started and how I ended up uh, transitioning into Vital Choice. Well, that's great. And so then just go into what, so then, well, how did you start Vital Choice? Like what made you decide you wanted to develop this type of company? Well, my expertise was uh, in seafood. I'd been going to Alaska for 20 years. I knew all the suppliers. I understood the product. I, although I had never heard of an omega-3 at that point, <laughs> uh, I would uh, get uh, get up to speed pretty quickly. Uh, I happened, to, it, there was a, a confluence of events uh, that led me to realize there was a, there were still people out there that wanted wild salmon, but couldn't find it because all the stores and all the restaurants had defaulted to farm salmon. It had the same advantages over uh, our wild caught salmon as a lot of other things. You know, it's farm salmon is plentiful, it's available 24 seven, 365, it's cosmetically perfect. It's uh, people back then didn't realize the, the big differences between wild and farm salmon. 
And so, uh, but there were some people out there who understood it. And when I told people about it, they wanted the wild salmon, they couldn't find it. And so uh, I basically modeled our company after another company called Omaha Steaks. Uh, a lot of people may have heard of them. They've been around for many, many years. They sell probably, a, I don't know, tens of millions of dollars worth of red meat that you can buy in most grocery stores. They sell a lot of other things now, but this is uh, about 18 years ago. And I thought, well, they're selling millions of dollars of red meat that you can buy in any grocery store that isn't necessarily that healthy. Uh, maybe there's a market for somebody to sell wild salmon, which isn't available, which is really healthy. And... Uh, so that was kind of the uh, the genesis of the company. I had one customer or one person who came up and really desperately wanted wild salmon and she didn't know where to find it. And so I told her that I would ship her some. And that was kind of the light bulb moment. Uh, so I shipped her some and then she had friends and uh, that all ultimately evolved into uh, the company we have today. Well, I'm so glad it did because your fish is absolutely delicious. And anyway, so let's really, let's start with the salmon since we're discussing that, you know, you were, were um, fishing for wild salmon and a lot of people, there's so much confusion and people, you know, a lot of people don't even know to ask for wild salmon and what is really the big reason that, that it makes such a difference. So if you could enlighten us to, I know we could go on and on and spend an hour probably on this, but the big key differences between the wild salmon and the farm raised salmon. Probably the simplest way to describe it is it's equivalent to the difference between a, a you know, wild game or a, a grass-fed beef and factory farm beef. Factory farm beef or pork or chicken or any other factory or, or, uh, farm livestock are primarily fed grain. And uh, as Michael Pollan says, you know, you're not only what you eat, but you're what you eat eats. <laughs> so when you eat factory farm uh, livestock, any of the above, uh, you're basically get, getting a lot of corn, a lot of grains, a lot of the, those fats, the omega-6 fats that are in in uh, the animals that are being fed them. You know, we subsidize corn and soy uh, in this country, and so it's the cheapest possible thing you can feed animals, and consequently that, that applies to farm salmon as well. Farm salmon are increasingly fed grains because it's a lot cheaper than, than uh, fish products, fish byproducts. So, uh, so starting there on the nutritional side, farm salmon are just a totally different animal than a wild salmon. A wild salmon is eating a natural diet, what it evolved to eat, what it's been eating for millennia. And uh, for instance, just a, a few things. Uh, wild salmon is a great source of vitamin D, which of course is a, a, applicable to our audience today in your community. Yes, absolutely. Vitamin D is really important. Wild salmon is one of the richest sources of vitamin D. Farm salmon don't have vitamin D to speak of. Or negative right, that's amounts. what's so incredible. They actually have done studies and there's a huge difference in the vitamin D content in wild salmon versus, versus um, you know, So as far as big differences, the nutritional differences are profound. Uh, there, there are major environmental differences. Wild salmon from well-managed fisheries such as in Alaska are one of the most sustainable foods on the planet, bar none. I'm talking organic produce, you name it. There's no food that I know of that is more sustainable than wild salmon because they get to live their lives as nature intended. They're harvested right at the end of their lives. They're managed, sci uh, scientists manage the fisheries so they, they're 100% sustainable. You'll find wild salmon on almost every, probably every reputable seafood wallet guide or seafood, uh, seafood guide. Uh, in the world, whereas farm salmon is usually in the, the red or the avoid list. And that's because of the way they're raised. They're raised out in open in pens in the open ocean, and so a lot of the pollutants go out into the marine environment, impacts the local ecosystem. Uh, they have just a lot of problems. If anybody's concerned, uh, seriously concerned about farm salmon, all you have to do is Google it, problems with farm salmon, and you can read for hours. And we could talk for hours about the differences, but uh, the bottom line is, if you can get wild salmon, you're, you're much better off doing so for a lot of reasons, uh, environmentally, nutritionally, and other reasons. Would you tell people to avoid farm salmon then? From what you uh, farm know? Farm salmon does have sub-omega-3s, so, which are critically important. 
And so if that's the only thing you can get, I think it's okay once, once in a while. And I also want to emphasize that all farm salmon is not the same, just like all wild salmon is not the same, or all anything is not the same, right? So there are reputable salmon farmers out there that are trying to do the right thing. They're feeding their fish uh, more responsibly. And, uh, uh, so I don't want to say 100% of the farm salmon are to be avoided, but... Uh, Generally, a, as a general rule, the, what you're going to find in most grocery stores or most restaurants is not that because it's more expensive to do it the right way, you know, and, obviously. You know, it's so funny because I've been at restaurants, nice restaurants, and I always, my first question is, you know, is the salmon wild? And they'll say, no, it's farm raised, but it's Scottish salmon and it's pristine waters and they're just fed. They make it like it's almost better. The, the answer that they've been given as a waiter is that it's almost better than the wild salmon. So what do you say to that when people, you know, tell well, you Well, first thing I say is uh, you, you are very well informed to be even asking that question <laughs> because few people do. But uh, as more and more people ask that question, there is more sort of pressure on the the restaurants and the grocery stores to bring in wild salmon. But there's sort of a gray area in between where we'll just say it's wild salmon, even though it's not, because most people can't tell the difference. And uh, I, I just can't tell you the number of times that I've been in places, they were either restaurants or grocery stores where it says it's wild, but it's actually farmed. And so that's uh, just probably two to three times in the last year I've been in restaurants where it was mislabeled. And obvious, uh, honestly, the, the Servers usually don't really know the difference, so they'll have to go to the kitchen. And, right. Uh, and that's your first clue that it's probably farmed salmon. If the, if the server doesn't know, uh, it's almost always farmed because if they're going to the trouble and expense to sort of buck the tide and, and go out and find good wild salmon, they're going to be proud of it. They're going to feature it, right? Right. It'll be on the menu, wild salmon. Yes, yes. But Although how even they... though it's on the menu as wild, that doesn't guarantee that it's farm. But uh, I mean, anyway, they... it's a minefield out there. The bottom line I always tell people is just just find reputable vendors, reputable fish people. You know, not many people are fortunate enough to be able to buy it off the boat. But uh, <laughs> there are stores out there and websites <laughs> where people really uh, take a lot of pride in finding the, the best fish and giving it to their customers. <laughs> well, my question is, though, in terms of it, it does look different. So what were some things maybe I know we're not going to be experts, but what are some things that maybe can tip you off that it's not wild? Because I know wild salmon. There is a difference, and we can see some of some of the differences. So why don't you just enlighten I would say ninety five percent of the wild salmon that you're going to find is from Alaska. Alaska is for fifty more than fifty years has done a magnificent job of managing their fisheries. They're also fortunate not to have much of a population up there, so the habitat is pristine, or they're fighting to keep it pristine. Really, in many uh, there are over thirty thousand miles of coastline in Alaska, tens of thousands of rivers. Almost all of them have salmon. And uh, they wrote right into their constitution when they founded the state that all their fisheries resources would be managed on a sustainable yield basis. Fabulous. And basically that just means that the fishing is controlled so that enough fish are allowed to escape and spawn to perpetuate the fishery. Which is, which is an is issue. Over which pardon? people always think, oh, I don't want to, you know, that yes, there. That's there. A, that's, yes, that's because, common. Common thought, but that's not true in Alaska. So that's you know, the, the two sockeye salmon went up the Snake River. That makes a great headline. You know? <laughs> the last two fish got over the dam, or what, whatever. And, and but in, they don't publish the fact that. And I'd be surprised if any of the people in the audience here know that in the, the last summer, Alaska in Bristol Bay, which is the biggest sockeye salmon run in the world, had the biggest run in recorded history. Oh, that's fabulous. So Isn't that nice? They've been keeping track for more than 50 years because they have, the scientists have got it down and they know how, the, the river that I used to fish in, I tell this story a lot because it's so dramatic, but the river that I used to fish in, in Alaska, had uh, an escapement goal. The scientists need, knew that they needed 2 million sockeye salmon to get through, so they would shut the fishermen down until they were sure they they had their two million fish. And that's really the, o the only, that's, that's all the fish the river would accommodate. The, they had the, the, the available spawning habitat would accommodate two million fish. Well, some years there would be five, 10. In 1995, 20 million fish came back to that river because the ocean conditions were so optimal. And this, you know, all the different things that affect the, the mortality 
uh, of those fish was just optimized. And so that was 18 million surplus salmon that came back to that river. Wow, isn't that wonderful? And every salmon that you get from Alaska is basically the result of that management process, no matter which river it comes from. Because if only one million fish came back to that river, the, the fishermen would be going home broke. <laughs> they wouldn't get any fishing time. And that's, but we all realize that our livelihood depends on not catching more than, you know, than, than are available. And so we respect the scientists and uh, the biologists that manage the river. So it's really a great story. So back to where we're, we started. So Alaska salmon, whenever you see Alaska salmon in the store, it's the product of that management regime. If it That's doesn't great. say Alaska, it's all, it could, there are limited numbers of wild salmon that may come out of British Columbia or uh, California at times, but 90, I'd say even 95% uh, are from oh, that's Alaska. great. If it doesn't say any of that, it, it may say Atlantic or Scottish or Chilean, but anything except for Alaskan is almost always farm salmon. As wow. far as the way that they look, the yeah. difference in the way they look, farm salmon typically has a much fatter, uh, wider uh, fat lines, much wider, bigger, more prominent fat lines. Uh, not always. Uh, Wild king salmon is a really fatty fish, and it can have that, but you don't see wild king salmon in the stores very often. So it's good, though. <laughs> yeah, it's the best. <laughs> and then, what about the color? Isn't it when it's usually a darker color, like the sockeye? Well, there are five different wild salmon species that are commonly available, and they range uh, depending on which species it is, which river system it comes from, because the color is a um, product of their feed. So feet, uh, wild salmon leave the rivers where they're, they're born and they migrate out of the ocean where they feed. And the thing that gives them the color is this al microalgae that they consume. Uh, and it has this carotenoid pigment in it and it turns their skin orange. Uh, sockeye salmon eats typically at the very bottom of the food chain. It eats krill and algae and plankton, it eats most of this. And so sockeye salmon are unique in that they have the most red flesh typically. Uh, king salmon can vary it from uh, deep orange all the way to white. Mm. Uh, we just got some chum salmon from the Yukon River in uh, in Alaska. That typically chum chum salmon or kita salmon is uh, not that dark orange, but these were amazing. These were some of the because they're in a different area, different river. They're eating differently, but but farm salmon is typically kind of a pale orange with the white lines and uh and that pigment that those farm salmon are being fed is not the natural uh carotenoid that they're get, they would normally be getting in the environment that's a synthetic carotenoid that is uh molec the molecule is different and that's a whole other story but it's just uh suffice it to say it's an artificial or a synthetic coloring agent so they're not actually fed dye but they're fed the synthetic version of this uh carotenoid that they but otherwise, it's a lot more expensive to feed them the actual algae. And so, you know, it's the same old, same old, same old. You know, get it, make mm. it as cheap as possible. And it's one of the reasons that farm salmon tends to be less expensive than wild salmon. Well, and Terry, let's go back to the health consequences because we didn't sure. really, we didn't touch on omega-3. And that is so important, the omega-3 fatty acids. That is so, so important for our bones. It's essential. And I think, and the balance is different between the omega-3 and the omega-6 when it comes to farm salmon and wild salmon. So why don't you touch on that? Because I think people don't really understand how important this is and how, what an amazing, amazing source of omega-3 the wild salmon can be. So, uh, you know, I've, I've heard it said that uh, wild salmon is the holy grail of superfoods. <laughs> And I, I really, the more I know it, well, I've known a lot about it now after all these years that I've been catching it and marketing it and telling its story, studying it. But uh, one of the major reasons is it's one of the very best sources of these omega-3 fatty acids. And omega-3 fatty acids are essential to every single cell in our body, the membrane around every single cell. And the organelles within the the cells have little membranes around them. And omega-3s are necessary for the optimal functioning, structure and functioning of every one of those 30 some trillion cells that we have in our body. Everywhere, our brain, our bones, uh, heart, you know. 
and uh, the main thing is that, uh, the big thing is that those omega threes have been depleted in our diet. Our terrestrial diet just really doesn't have many of those. Marine foods, seafood is really the best source of the types of omega threes. There's, as you know, a lot of different types of omega threes. The short chain that you get in vegetables, the uh, chia seeds and walnuts, and so on and so forth. But the ones that are really uh, bioactive, the ones we really need for our brain and, and uh, cell membranes are the, uh, the long chain, DHA and the EPA. And wild seafood, salmon in particular, is just one of the very best sources of that. You know, in addition to the omega-3s, we also need omega-6s. But they're, they're, uh, they kind of work against one another. The, uh, you often and read that the omega threes are sort of anti-inflammatory, where the omega sixes exactly. in excess are pro-inflammatory. So the the key thing that you almost never read about more recently, but you almost never read about the importance of the ratio of those, getting a balance throughout evolution, throughout millions of years of hominid evolution, our diets were roughly equal, threes and sixes. And uh, since the dawn of agriculture, and especially in the last fifty to hundred years. Uh, that has just been skewed dramatically. Now it's more, it could be anywhere from 20 to 30 times more omega-6s. It's, it's so, really amazing because I've been having a lot of people I work with tested because that is a source of inflammation and inflammation can affect everything. It can affect your bones. It can affect every single organ in your body. And for each person, it's different what symptoms they're going to have. But when, when it's out of balance like that, when there's so much high, I mean, I've seen people 20 to one, you know, as you're saying, 16 to one people have been getting tested. It's it, it, the standard American diet is very, very, you know, and, and what's causes what's the six is it's all those vegetable oils and there's so many processed food that's very high in absolutely the back to the, yeah, and back to the farm salmon because they are fed relatively high amounts of these grain products, they have a lot more omega sixes. So if you're trying to correct your omega-3, omega-6 balance, you eat a wild salmon, you might have nine more, nine times as many omega-3s as omega-6s. If you eat a farm salmon, it's reversed. There are going to be a lot more omega-6s than omega-3s. So, uh, and just yeah, for everybody eat... listening, though, that that can be a source of inflammation. You know, people don't realize that. They think, I'm eating salmon. That's super healthy. This is the farm salmon. Like, they don't, they, people don't realize that by doing that, you can actually be increasing your omega sixes and not getting the benefit of the omega threes and causing more inflammation. So, you know, Marge, I don't know if you've read them, but there are just more and more studies all the time pointing at the just the damage that this uh, skewed ratio is doing to us. And almost all diseases of aging are uh, the common thread, the grand unified field theory of, of chronic disease is this chronic inflammation driven by, by the modern American diet. And I don't think that one of the unexpected consequences, the wonderful serendipitous things that happened when I started the company was I'm selling directly to a lot of curious people and they have all these questions. And I really wanted to be able to give them credible answers. So I started going to conferences and going, getting in touch with nutrition experts. And I figured out I sort of trended toward the scientific conferences because these are just researchers and scientists. They have the least amount of bias, not that it <laughs> escape all of it, but uh, so I befriended many, many nutrition scientists and biochemists and some of the pioneers in the field that figured this out 30, 40 years ago. Some of the people that discovered this, uh, this biochemistry and uh, several years ago, Dr. William Lands, who was one of the people that discovered this suggested he said, this is so important to get this ratio right that you guys should offer uh, a test kit on your website. Anyway, make a long story short, we did that. And we believe in it. So I've seen just anecdotally so many people get, get over chronic illnesses just simply by reducing those omega-6s, increasing the omega-3s. Omega-3s are critical, but the problem is we're getting so many omega-6s that they basically overwhelm the omega-3. So you've got to really do both. And for anybody that's interested, we have a page on our website. It's uh, if you just go to vitaltest.com. Vitaltest.com. You can read about that. You can see an interview with Dr. Uh, Lands and several other of these sort of world-renowned experts it's talking about the importance of omega ratio. It's really my personal passion because I've seen my own family members 
get over conditions that they're, they had been told for years were genetic or there's no cure and they were inflammation based. And when we learned this and we were, we fortunately had access to a lot of good seafood, but we also uh, learned about the importance of lowering omega-6s. Figure out where in the diet those sixes are and reduce them. And bone health is I would just right smack dab in the middle of, uh, you know, one of the things that will, one of the many things that will benefit by doing this, you know, arthritis is one of the most uh, oste osteoarthritis is one, you know, basically an inflammatory, you know, major inflammatory uh, disease. And you know, I'm so big into root cause, and I think it's so important not to mask the symptoms. And this could be a root cause that you have inflammation because of the imbalance in our standard diet today of the omega six and omega-3, and people don't realize sometimes how powerful food can be. So yay for wild salmon, and yay for you bringing in healthy wild salmon to everyone that's so yummy. Um, but some more, some more questions, that because there's a lot of things that people are concerned about. So let's, let's just sort of hit them, because you, know, you are the man of knowledge here and, and experience, and I always learn so much from you. So let's talk about mercury, because that's something that people you know, it's like throwing the baby out with the bathwater. You know, with mercury, people are very afraid of mercury. They certainly don't want to increase the, the amount of mercury they're eating. And so why don't you just give us your take on mercury? Well, I, I again, I've studied the science for years because we got that question so much. That's probably the top question for yeah. the years. <laughs> well, what about mercury? I read these headlines that, it, you know, all fish has got mercury in it. Uh, so we did a lot of testing. And what we discovered is that yes, all fish has trace levels of mercury, pretty much everything in the ocean does because it's been there forever. You know, it's uh, most of the mercury in the ocean or at least big percentage of the mercury in the ocean is from natural causes, you know, the erosion of the land. And the, and uh, the question is, you know, it's all about the dose makes the poison. How much, how much is, is uh, does it take to be harmful? And the, the bottom line, the most, uh, elegant big studies that have looked at the most vulnerable populations have found over and over again that the benefits of the seafood vastly outweigh the risk there is very little evidence that eating uh, you know the more desirable fish you want to eat the smaller fish that eat toward the bottom of the food chain as opposed to the large apex predators that live can a you, long can time. you just be really specify so people know what yes, those okay. large, yeah make it give them the detail so you don't so you think of a shark that's out there for 30 40 years swimming around eating a lot of other fish every time you go up the food chain one step i've heard it said that it biomagnifies the mercury by a factor of 10. so if you eat at the top fish or you know, predatory fish, marine mammals, shark, big bill fish, fish that have been around for a long time, a giant tuna, uh, they're going to have the most methylmercury concentrated, as opposed to if you eat fish that don't live very long. A salmon only lives two to four years. That's its natural life cycle. Uh, sardines only live a few years. They eat krill and plankton. They're not bioaccumulating. They're not around long enough to do it. They're not eating fish, other fish that have methylmercury. So, uh, Really, the, uh, we don't worry about it at all at our company because we target fish that that uh, are known to be the cleanest. And for years, we tested and validated that it's really it's really a function of the type of, of fish that you're eating. A lot of people say avoid tuna. Tuna's got a lot of mercury in it. Well, there are three pound, ten pound tuna that don't you know that are younger or whatever that don't have that much mercury. And there are 500 pound bluefin tuna that have been swimming around for decades. Uh, now I wanna add that this mercury fear is pretty unique to the United States. And it's been, uh, and uh, the, the media has used it, you know, fear mongered just because it makes great headlines. But you can go to Japan and now no matter what sort of biometric you're looking at, they're healthier than humans. They're much lower infant mortality, much longer life expectancy. They're really pretty smart people, and they eat not only the population in general, but pregnant women eat fish all the time, many times a week, and all of that fish has trace levels of methylmercury. And uh, That's so, I, I had an NIH scientist come up to my table one time when we used to focus on this. We had a chart 
showing the mercury average mercury levels in different fish and he said you know you're really doing more harm than good with this because you're planting the seed that fish is toxic and uh you mentioned uh, earlier that uh, you had an OBGYN person who- Husband, uh, yes, yes. Yes, your husband. Yes. So it's interesting because they have, and I actually have them here, the guidelines from the um, ACOG, the American College of Obstetri Obstetricians and Gynecologists, and they have very specific guidelines. So my husband asked me, because I was telling him about the, what I was doing, he said, you know, that I should ask you what your thought was because they don't differentiate. They give you... So give me a couple minutes. That, uh, I would love to answer that. For, uh, yes. So the biggest, okay. uh, I, I, the biggest, uh, most credible study that I'm aware of that has ever been done on this looked at uh, 14,000 pregnant nursing women in the UK, and they've looked at them for many years, and uh, 14,000 mother-child pairs. And when they did, they fully expected the women who tested initially to have the highest mercury levels to have the kids with the most developmental problems, neurocognitive problems. After the years went by, it's been over 20 years now, they figured out it was just exactly the opposite. Wow. That advi advising women to avoid seafood while they're pregnant actually causes the harm it's intended to prevent in uh, developmental problems. So just, uh, I just got back from a trip to Washington, D.C., where this uh, this person uh, who's working on the dietary guidelines for 2020. Oh, USDA. fantastic, Randy. Yeah. So they put together an advisory panel of, I don't know, more than a dozen scientists, not industry-related people, so about as objective and credible as you can get. They went out and they looked at, I think it was 40 different studies the latest most cre they graded the study so they they were the most credible they represented over 120,000 mother child pairs and what they came what they concluded was that up to 100 of ounces 100 ounces a week there was no harm shown in the kids and and what and what what is typically ignored by a lot of OBGYNs and a lot of people are counseling pregnant women they totally dismiss the the benefits, you know, those omega threes, the copper, mercury, zinc, B vitamins, D vitamins. They dismiss that. They look at fish as a, sort of a, a vessel for mercury, and they forget that it's really a whole food with a whole bunch of other benefits. But what they found was, and this, I can, I will send you this study oh, uh, yes. separately. And I, but, I'll uh, post, what, what I'll, they found I'll put it was in the, the notes. Yeah, the women who ate seafood while they were pregnant gave birth to kids who had up to a seven up to a nine point iq uh higher iq than the, the mothers born to kids who didn't eat the seafood this is incredible um, so this so, is really uh, so wow, that, that, is... that 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 uh statement that advising women to severely limit or avoid seafood while they're pregnant and this is very common still which is why i'm passionate about trying to get the word yeah. out i mean we've got a lot of mental health problems you know, we've got AD and D off the charts, uh, you know, rising uh, constantly for a lot of different reasons. But uh, well, I think the interesting thing is, obviously, you want to avoid the fish that you talked about with the high levels. Obviously, those fish, the swordfish, the you know, the sword, the fish that you had told us about before. But in their guidelines, you know, they limit it to, to two servings of salmon. But there's going to be a very big difference then if you're eating the wild salmon versus, you know, it's not. It's not specified. So this is great. You know, there are you know? so many different uh, yeah. agendas. There's yeah. so many different agendas. And I have no doubt that the environmental community is going to push back on this recommendation. And you know how politics drives food policy more than science, mm. way more. But you know what? Science and studies, I think, in this community of OBGYNs, they just really want to help their patients. So I That's think right. I really do believe when the research is in, and that there's scientific good studies, I really do think that's going to be a game changer. So fantastic. Well, and people are so yeah. whiplashed because one week they'll say, well, this is safe. And the next week, the other, you know, this isn't safe. And, you know, we're, we're yeah. all, we've all watched that. I really believe when it comes to omega-3s and fish oil and seafood, you know, you'll see one headline that, uh, and we've been led to believe over a lot of years, and I think justifiably that omega-3s and ideally and from seafood that's the best possible source of it uh are, are great for heart health right but then all of a sudden you'll see a study come out well uh fish oil causes prostate cancer or uh. fish oil that didn't <laughs> help this population but what nobody really looks at i i think one of the main reasons is they're not looking at background levels of omega-6s 
And so if uh, you have a population and you're not paying attention, if they're eating 20 times more omega-6s than omega-3s, then yeah, of course, uh, taking a couple capsules of fish oil every day is not- And to, uh, well, fish oil is not created equal. So can you, why don't you just tell us the difference? Because a lot of people will say, well, I'll, I'll just pop some fish oil. I don't need to take the omega-3s. Well, no. I think, uh, you know, there have been over 30,000 studies, fish oil studies, omega-3 studies, and most of them have used sort of the industrial grade fish oil. And there have, uh, I, over 80% of them have showed benefit. And I think that as long as you go with the major brands or, you know, popular reputable brands, that it's absolutely better than nothing. Right, absolutely. Uh, but I don't think anybody can dispute I'm 110% sure nobody can dispute that getting them in the form that you get when you're eating the fish, you know, the food that we evolved to eat, it's in the form that our bodies recognize and uh, you're going to, uh, it's just more bioavailable in the food form. Exactly. But it's better than nothing to get, you know, to oh, take the sure. supplement. And, and, uh, right. And your body knows what to do with it when it eats it. Uh, one of the scientists that I know said that a lot of the fish oil will either get burned as energy or get stored as adipose fat. And, uh, yeah. you know, there's the, the whole uh, triglyceride form of fish oil, which is what we generally do, because there is some evidence that that's more bioavailable. Uh, versus the ethyl ester, which is the more common form. It's more, uh, it's cheaper to produce. And uh, so that's one distinction. You could look for the triglyceride versus the ethyl ester form. Oh, well, thank you. I have so many other questions and I could spend hours, but I have a couple key things. Sure, I'll but one try thing to also talk though, faster. Wait, no, 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 don't talk faster. The selenium though, isn't that true that because fish has high selenium, that also helps with the mercury in That's terms a fantastic of, question. Yeah. Thank you for asking that. Uh, Yes, there's a lot of evidence that, that well, uh, chemically, chemi uh, biochemically, selenium has a high binding uh, factor, uh, binding affinity with uh, methylmercury. So, in other words, one of the problems with methylmercury when you ingest it, if you have an absent, it will go into the cells and it'll bind with the methylmercury, and your cells need methylmercury. Excuse me, uh, will bind with the selenium. Your cells need selenium, so you may be running a deficit. That's when you get toxicity and problems. Seafood is one of the richest sources of selenium. So back to which ones should I eat? Almost all of the all of the seafood that you can buy in the supermarket has way more selenium than methylmercury. And so the the hypothesis is that you're getting your uh, sort of an, an, antidote with the fish, which explains why people in Japan, pregnant women in Japan, can eat fish multiple times a week or multiple times a day and not have a problem. Uh, we have a lot of this. Uh, we've been publishing a newsletter on our website for almost 17 years, and we've got a huge database with all kinds of uh, articles about this and just about anything else you, you uh, can think of. I think you it makes us feel website. good. Yeah. 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 Your articles are great. You have so much information. I, I just think it makes people feel good to know that there's a natch selenium, you know, when you're taking the fish, you're also getting, as you said, like the antidote for the mercury. There's only a few of the larger species that we talked about earlier where the methylmercury is so high that, uh, and a lot of the, a couple of the studies on which the avoidance, you know, avoid seafood recommendations were based, the advisories, the FDA advisory in 2004 to avoid, avoid seafood was based on two studies, one in New Zealand, one in the Faroe Islands, where people, in the Faroe Islands, people were eating a uh, pilot whale, so a big marine mammal. <laughs> oh no. Often in ritual type settings where they're consuming a lot of it, sort of like turkey on Thanksgiving. <laughs> so it would spike their, uh, and so they actually did see, see some adverse. Uh, and then other, another one in New Zealand where they were eating tiger shark. So both of these are big, you know, high mercury fish with hardly any selenium. And you say, well, why did they use those studies? Those were the only studies they could find where there was an association between fish consumption and mercury poisoning. Wow. Another question that I get asked all the time, what about plastics in the ocean? That's a great question. And it's uh, really, uh, there's no question that we're messing up our, uh, our oceans and it's uh, all of our charitable efforts and resources are going into clean, you know, cleaning up our oceans. And uh, as far as, uh, you know, practically speaking, I think it's kind of similar to the methyl mercury issue. It is there. There's not any evidence that I've come across that it's harm, you know, harmful. I mean, usually 
as I understand it, if the fish does ingest the plastic, it stays in the GI tract, which you're not typically ingesting. And uh, there was one study out of the UK that said that, that, that people ate shellfish for a year, they might consume 100 pieces of microplastic. And we're talking like dust, tiny particles. The other side of the equation is, well, we're also getting it in our terrestrial food. You know, the, the, dust, the, stu the dust that settles on the, the food. That particular study, you say, well, you, you might get 100 pieces of, in just 100 pieces of microplastic, uh, from eating shellfish throughout the year, you, you could get 100,000, you know, of these pieces of microplastic uh, just eating your normal terrestrial meals. So, so it's not something uh, I'm not that... trying to dismiss it, but there is right. very little evidence that uh, there's any human harm. And again, you have to weigh it towards all the benefits that, that you're getting. And, it, and, uh, and of course, it has to do with where those fish are coming from. So if you go to the cleanest, most pristine areas, which is like Alaska, Alaska. <laughs> you're going to have, you're going to get fish that are the cleanest. I personally, uh, I'm, I've got a, a Google alert. I watch for all the uh, microplastic news that's coming out. And um, it's interesting because people will say to me, assessment. I love people will, will say, oh, I choose the farm raised because they'll make sure there's no plastic. <laughs> yes. Well, that's, uh, you know, <laughs> It's just not black and white. There's just right, a whole lot of not, other things right. you're getting in the farm. No, of course not. I'm just, I yes. just, I'm just saying this is, you know, people interpret things, in, inter interpret things differently. Um, I wanted to say a couple other things before before our time is out. Um, with something for osteoporosis that is so great and my favorite. I love, absolutely love your sardines. They are just. This is a real win-win food for for everybody. But it has. I mean, each, each can of yours has, it says, when you look at the can, it'll say 35% calcium. So that's 350 milligrams. This is the ones with the bones. And I think the one that tastes so good is the one with the olive oil that you have. Um, <laughs> it's really delicious. It's really, I mean, it's, it's my favorite by far. It's just so good. Um, but it's just such a great food. It's easy to, easy, you know, it's easy to keep. It's easy to open a can and it's delicious and you're getting really you're getting omega you're getting vitamin d you're getting a lot of calcium it's just a great win-win bone food you know very healthy so i just wanted to yeah i'm glad you mentioned that because uh, you're right any of the canned fish products that are cooked they, they're cooked in the can and packed with the bone so not only the sardines those are one of my favorites too i like the one with the chili pepper in it oh i didn't taste <laughs> but, that uh, one <laughs> um but also our canned salmon. I don't know. A lot of people may not be familiar with canned salmon, or you know, our grandmas may have made salmon patties that didn't taste that that well. But uh, really, the wild sockeye canned salmon is just fabulous. It's so convenient, and we have with bones and without bones. But uh, the traditional style is like the sardine, packed with and uh, processed with the bone in, so you have all that calcium and. Uh, it's just a great way to get calcium, and it's so tasty. You're right, you do have, I tasted when, I, when you were at the show, one of the conferences, you had all the different flavors, and that's still mm -hmm. my favorite, the plain one, but they are very good. The, um, in terms, so, so I think just sardines are just really, really wonderful. Now, your fish is a lot, of, it's frozen when it comes to people, so tell us about the process, and does that, do you lose anything in the fact that it's being Yeah, frozen? that's a, another common mis-, mis Right. conception that frozen is inferior to fresh and really all fresh means is it hasn't been frozen to a lot of people you know they say well, I'd rather have fresh fish maybe it took 10 days to get to the supermarket and another <laughs> couple of days in my refrigerator versus taking a fish out of the water that is perfection flash freezing it vacuum sealing it and maintaining it in that condition until we ship it to our customers that they get it frozen they thawed out and it tastes like it just came out of the water and if you go to our website, there's a little widget up on the top of the homepage called uh, Trust Pilot. And uh, we've have, we haven't been doing it, I think, six, seven years, but we've got over 14,000 reviews from our customers. And it's just, if, if I'm ever feeling a little down, which isn't very often, I'll just read a few of those because it's so, I mean, people say they don't, they've just never tasted fish that well. And I think that's how we've stayed in business for 18 years. 
It, it uh, really, I mean, but it's such a win-win because not only is it delicious, it really is, but it's so healthy. So you just feel, it's one of those feel good things. You're, you know, you feel like you're really helping your health and it's, um, so I'm so grateful that you created this company because it is so yummy and healthy. Well, it's a labor of love. We, we just really believe in it and, uh, just enjoy, you know, being a fisherman for 20 years, I and my partner, Dave, we were both fishermen for many years and, uh, we're seafood snobs. <laughs> we just go out and buy. We know, you know, there's certain areas where the fish is better than others and certain catch methods and so on and so forth. And, to the mercury we know that the smaller fish have less mercury than the bigger fish so we focus on the smaller ones and uh so we just try to take all the worry out of out of the process and i know you test everything i, I know and i know even when you know in terms of nuclear and problems like that that you tested your fish and yeah we test you know there was a lot of concern since fukushima there's been a lot of concern a lot of headlines again about radiation in the pacific the ocean and irradiated fish and there's still a lot of people that have avoided seafood but we've had it tested by the most credible labs and there's just no there is is no uh, radiation in in our we've had over 16 species tested again if you go to the website and type in radiation in the search window you can read all the articles that we've published about it but one other thing i just want to say before we go is a sure. lot of people who think they don't like seafood it's because there is so much bad seafood out there. <laughs> I swear, I go to restaurants, I'll always order seafood, and half the time it's rancid, it tastes, uh, it's just, and a lot of people I think fear, well, they just think they don't like seafood because they've had some bad experiences. And face it, it's, you get a piece of rancid fish, it's foul, who wants to experience that again? And uh, I like what so you just, I would just say, say, give it another try. If you're one of those people that, or you think canned salmon is, yucky tastes like cat food well a lot of the pro processes will put the worst quality fish into the can because you can hide and, and so because dave and i are sort of uh, my partner and i are seafood snobs we know where to go to where they're putting the best fish in the can or right the and the cans you them. use the right cans too we, we can that's a whole nother talk <laughs> in terms of but but um yeah no and, and i've heard you speak before that it should not taste fishy and it should not smell fishy Right. Some people think, oh, that's just fish. But, you know, for years we've been going to conferences at all kinds of venues, cooking our fish, and we have never once got kicked out or com had people complain about the odor because it generally it, it tastes, it smells good. It attracts people. Well, I don't know and, what you uh, put in when you cook those at the conferences. It just, you have a line so long because it's so yummy. <laughs> yeah. I walked into Costco one day and they were, you know how at Costco they do the demos like on the weekends and you walked in the door and it was the most foul odor and they were, oh, no. they were grilling farm salmon and it's a totally different fat yeah. matrix and, the, and different kinds of fat. And I, I, I imagine that was probably the one and only time they ever did it because if you try to, if you try to cook, you know, grill some farm salmon in your house, chances are it wouldn't smell nearly as good. Mm. So. Ah, well, this has been so amazing. And we'll have all the links because it's also a great gift. It's coming, my, this interview will be out right in the holiday season. So it's, I mean, certainly a gift I would love. <laughs> and yeah, so have, we're, we're, we're uh, I think we're creating a discount code for yes, your yes. community. And uh, so I think it's happy bones. About. Yes, I'll write that. I'll, I'll put it in the in the show notes, the um, the discount code. Yes, uh, thank you. That's very kind of you. So thank you for that. And anything else you want to end with before we before we end? I would just encourage anybody that wants more information to go to our website, check out our newsletter uh, archive, and you can search. Uh, like I said, we've been probably published over a thousand original articles on all the stuff we've talked about, and uh, just a lot of great information. I can't thank you enough because you really set the record straight because there is so much confusion. And I think you've given us really good, solid information. So now we're going to all eat our fish and eat our wild fish. And for those who haven't tried Vital Choice, I highly recommend it because it is, even the tuna, I just have a quick story. The last time I was at in New York City, that you were at the conference, the Integrative Health Conference, and I was staying with a friend, and I wanted to just bring her a little gift, so I brought her a whole thing of the tuna, and she said she couldn't eat tuna in the past; her face would break out, but she could eat this, and she was like, it didn't bother her. And she said, I never tasted anything so delicious. So I've heard that kind of story a lot. Uh, there was a person who had a histamine. I, I don't know if you remember uh, the woman that uh, 
her name escapes me right now, but she had a community that was uh, sensitive to histamines. And so, uh, make a long story short, she tried her fish and all of a sudden, she didn't think she could eat seafood because her histamines were a problem with so much of it. But uh, yeah. you know, it's really all about the quality and getting, getting fish that's chosen well and cared for well, and uh, then it's usually pretty satisfying. Oh, well, that's great. Well, thank. Keep doing all you're doing, and we so appreciate it. And I, I'm so grateful for you to come on the show and just share all this great knowledge with everyone. So, well, thank- really a pleasure, Margie. Thank you so much for having me and uh, for the opportunity to help enlighten your community. Oh well, thanks so much, and hope we'll keep in touch, Ray. And I'll see you at the I'm next. I'm going to send show. your husband. I'm going to send your husband that uh, those studies that I was reading. Yes, you know what? Actually, I will. I'm going to post them in the show notes too. So send them to me, and I will post the links because I think that you know we we can, this is really it's very important. If there's good research available, this needs to be you know, and people babies are actually healthier. We need to get that information out. So. Okay. <laughs> All right. And remember, balance your threes and sixes. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> that will help your bones. All this will help your bones too. Vitaltest.com. Right. Bye bye, Margie. Thank <laughs> bye. you. Thank bye. Thank you now. so much, Randy. I hope you've enjoyed today's interview with Randy as much as I have. And now a better understanding of safe seafood so you can reap all the health benefits. All the links we talked about are in the show notes. And Randy has been so generous with this community and is offering a 10% discount on any order. All you need to do is put the code in Happy Bones. And if you order before December 4th, he has the holiday special going on, which is actually 15% off. So all that information is in the show notes. And thank you for joining us today and look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Happy Bones, Happy Life podcast. If you enjoyed this show, please subscribe on your favorite listening app so that you don't miss any amazing insights on upcoming episodes. And until next time, continue to live your best life ever. See you soon.